So, question, a lot of questions. We just like. which is the, the separation between presence, absence, and the notion of intensity, frequency, complexity. And I think there is a major flow in our reasonings in general about many hominin behaviors, ranging from tool making to uh, funerary practices or any sort of things of this kind, that people rezone in general in terms of presence, absence. And when you say presence, you assume it just like us. And, and in fact, the real story is much more complex. Now I have two questions. One is, uh, do you suggest that the uh, low equate type of tools are those that are used to make the uh, cut marks that you find in the Kika? Um, and second, my second question is how you reconcile um, the, the, the oldest evidence for uh, marks, tool marks on, on bones of this kind, like cuts, with the, the recent paper that was published by one of the co-author of the Dikika paper on the cut marks, uh, Curtis Marin, on the notion that um, a bone crushing and marrow extraction predates uh, the consumption of meat and the, the cut marks. Thanks for the two questions, Jean-Jacques. On the first one, what I would say is when we published the paper in 2010, we had suggested, we had written actually, that there was some type of excessive use of force in generating those marks. Could that forceful, uh, basically, attack on those bones result from the amount of force that they applied? Or could it be that the tools used were so big in a similar way of what you have at Lomakwe? I think at this point, what we know is that the two are contemporaneous, but making the link will have to involve more research. And maybe Sonia will have something to say about that. On the second one, uh, people were almost, I would say, uh, obsessed with cut marks. But I think what may have been the precursor for cutting is mainly percussion, which would be handy, especially as a new adventurer of an early hominin with a small body size venturing into the open, uh, threatened by the scavengers, uh, just imagine the paleo landscape under uh, which these early hominins, wh which, which were not good runners, <laughs> uh, still climbing for me anyway. So the, the, the pressure that they had upon them was huge. So it would have it made more sense for them to actually go after scavengers and then try to access the bone marrow, which would then explain the notion of percussion coming before cutting the meat. Actually, that is an inherent part of the new hypothesis that I pointed out towards the end. And uh, I do s agree with what uh, Curtis says in that paper as well. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Oui. Hélène. Yeah, how much stone is there in that landscape around the Kika? How far would you have to go to find stone that you can make into stone tools? Five kilometers. Five kilometers. Is it abundant or scarce? There are, but we are not tools. Yeah. What we know is if they were to exploit the raw material, the closest would have been five kilometers. So uh, now I'm going to speak just for myself, not my colleagues. I think the best explanation for us at this point is they may have been using naturally occurring sharp edge tools yeah. rather than making them. I ask because I, when I worked in Pakistan in big fluvial landscapes, and I described those as research rich but stone poor. In other words, there's plenty of meat out there to eat, but very little stone mm -hmm. to access those carcasses. So what I think they were doing was focusing on the few outcrops of 
stone and working around those. I mean, maybe there's an effective radius in yeah. which they can't uh, use stone because it's too far to carry. It, it would not be impossible for you know, a biped creature to go and access those uh, raw materials, but because we have not found the stone tools themselves, I would be reticent uh, from saying further about what type of stones were used. Yeah. Yeah, it's the first time that I really see you presenting your paper, and it's very interesting and convincing, I have to say. <laughs> but it's more a comment than a question that I wanted to ask you. Um, as, which refers to what you said at the beginning of your presentation. There is about the steps between uh, stone to, uh, tool using and tool making. I agree with you that there is a very short distance between tool using and tool modifi modifying, modifying. But to modi when it, it concerns modification of uh, brittle or, or, or flexible material, but when, when you are dealing with stone tools, it's totally, yeah, there are big steps between modifi modifying a, a, a brittle or s flexible material and stone. This is a big difference. There is a big difference in the way of making and, and, and everything. This is one, one thing. Maybe you want to? No, go ahead, go ahead. You have another one? And the other, and the other thing is I think that uh, the, the Modification you have on your on your bones can be made by a simple flake. No need to have something very mm -hmm. complicatedly made, you know. Good. I think on the last one, I would agree with you, because you know better <laughs> on this topic of yeah. stone tool use. Yeah. And we don't have the tools, so at this point, I would just yes conquer with you. On the first one, uh, maybe I did not explain it well. Actually, I was referring to John Napier's idea yeah. of how he saw, you know, when they published the Homo habilis paper, uh, maybe if Copernicus knows the story, uh, he was one of the, uh, the, pa the, the authors of that Homo habilis paper. So I can imagine how much struggle he had to deal with yeah. ag against <laughs> Louis Leakey because Lewis wanted a homo who is tool maker, whereas for Napier, it was not a big deal. As he says, modifying something is a short distance. So uh, the claim that I showed was more of John Napier's, and I was trying to use it as a historical progression rather than a claim made by myself. No, no. I wouldn't have been able to do that anyway because I'm not an archaeologist. Thank you. Okay. Right. I'd like to congratulate you on your work. Secondly, I'd just like to mention what we have done in South Africa at Krumdry, where I'm currently working with Jose. We did X-ray diffraction analysis on the bone tools, and we discovered bone appetite on the stone tools. So my recommendation is that you do X-ray diffraction, focusing the X-ray beams on the working edge of the tool, so in the case of percussion, looking at the edges that have been uh, struck. But that's my recommendation. You try to combine the two. It's actually done. And in our nature paper, we report on that because the chemistry of a bone, uh, no, a, a crystal, that we thought was dislodged from the, 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 the rock itself had a very different chemical composition compared to the chemical composition of the cut mark itself, which as you would guess is rich in calcium. Whereas the other one was very rich in what we call ferromagnesian elements. So uh, we've done that, but because it's dependent on just one crystal that my colleagues were very excited about, I have reservations on that, so I would like to see more. But I, we've just done that, and indeed, that crystal that we thought was dislodged from the stone tool itself is sitting in the mark itself, and it has a very different 
calcium poor, very magnesium rich uh, composition. But thank you for the recommendation. Are there any indications of cut marks on uh, our ancestors' bones from this time, which uh, might indicate uh, cannibalism? Um, it's, it's not uncommon to uh, find uh, defleshed uh, skulls or bones, bone remains of hominins, especially in later times. Uh, what is the, maybe Jean-Jacques knows, what is the earliest evidence for cannibalism, Jean-Jacques, do you know? Uh, but it won't go that far. Uh, but I think my answer would be, um, I know the border specimen was def deflushed, and that goes back to 500,000 years. Eight, 800,000 something. 800,000, uh, yes. uh, so, okay. so that would go back, uh, thank you, Jean-Jacques. Jean-Jacques says 800, so that must be true. But there is also a species called Homo heidelbergensis, dated back to 500,000, where Tim White pointed out that there were the flushing. And that would then take you to more, uh, was that a ritual practice, or was it because consuming the meat for calorie purposes? Uh, those are things that are uh, debated, but the evidence still remains very, very uh, slim, I would say. But, but that is uh, uh, one of the fundamental questions because it pertains to symbolism in our species, also in our lineage. Any more questions? Yeah, Michel. Zere, thank you for your nice contribution. Just a small question. Uh, when you ask about the cutting, where? Your answer is East Africa or South Africa? Am I right? Is that the question? The question is, for me, I shall prefer to answer, but probably I am wrong, but I shall prefer an answer of the type somewhere in Africa. Okay, I think my, in my presentation what I said was where is obviously in Africa, but based on current evidence, we can say conf confidently that it was around Kenya, Ethiopia. But if you press me hard, would what you call Bahar Ghazali would be able to do, to do the same thing as what is happening in East Africa? Hands down, the answer is yes. If uh, was Africanus capable of doing that? Hands down, that's also is yes. So for me, there is no geographic discrimination for hominin or especially early hominin behavior. You can find them anywhere in Africa. For that matter, in Norway, uh, if you find the right species, then they would be able to use stone tools. That would be my answer. So yes, I agree with you. It could be anywhere in Africa. Anywhere those hominins are, actually. Well, thank you. Well, Michel, no? Okay. So why not in Brittany? <laughs> My question was just because everywhere, when you are in a congress, in a symposium, a lot of people are speaking about Africa, but only about East and South Africa. We are, we. Uh, no, I, no. Would, no. I, would, I would defer to. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's a, I can understand this, 
But the problem is, at this time, when you look at Africa and when you look at the fossil, the answer is, it's clear. We have not enough fossil. We have not enough. Which is clear is that we are going to find a lot somewhere in Africa. Why we have only in East and South Africa? Why? Because a lot of people are working there. A lot. It just, but uh, it's just a small reflection. But I think that for young people who want to work in paleoanthropology, it's uh, very important to know that Africa is probably cradle of mankind, and we don't know at this time where is it exactly, and we never know, because I think that it's not a good question that Africa is a cradle of humanity, and there is a lot, a lot of place, a lot to do, and sometimes I don't understand why we want to localize east and south. It's a matter of history. It's all that I want to say. Uh, if you may allow me. I, I think uh, either I don't understand the point or I may have misspoken, but I don't think I did, because for me, the bottom line is that Darwin, long time ago, told us that Africa is a cradle of mankind, and he did not actually need any fossil evidence to suggest that. He only had the morphological similarities between humans and great apes, and he did speculate very well without the genetic or the fossil evidence that Africa was a cradle of mankind. And then when Raymond Dahl did what he did, we know the opposition that he had to face. I think today we are in a much better place to not only say that Africa is a cradle of mankind, but we can ask more refined questions. For example, what is the earliest hominin today that we know of? It's in Chad. Where are the earliest stone tool cut marks? They are in East Africa. Where is Australopithecus africanus? It's in South Africa. So what we have today is not a fight between regions, but is more of asking questions that are more refined than the big question of Africa as a cradle of mankind, which no one, I think, in this room is going to disagree. You are right. Everybody is right. But anyway, it's because we love Ethiopia, of course. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I love it. Well, that's my, my answer, and I don't want any comment about yes. it. <laughs> okay, more questions. Bridget. Short one about the tools. Uh, in non-human primates, quite a non-human primates make tools, even if it just break knots or whatever, and they get flakes. And these flakes could be a good idea for your for your babies, if I may say so. So my question is: Do you have some collection of flakes or accumulation of flakes, as we can see with chimpanzees or capucin monkeys, which could be actually a source of uh, pre-tools or tool use or whatever? At the site, yeah. So at the site, what we have are basalts that are located at about five to seven kilometers from the site. And we, because we don't have any stone tools at the site where we have the cut marks, we don't know what type of stone tools they had used. There is nothing. Uh, but I also work with uh, an archaeologist. His name is uh, Shannon McFern. He is the most <laughs> conservative archaeologist that you can find. You can give him a ton of artifacts on the site. Unless it's in situ, he's not going to buy it. Uh, so my answer is we will go back 
as much as we can and try to find those stone tools. But until Shannon is convinced, there is nothing that I will tell you here because I'm not really the archaeologist of the project. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any question? Well, thank you very much. It was very interesting, very important. And, um, well, it's always the, uh, our mind who would, would love to, to have correlation between something and something else. And uh, as it, it is not working all the time, there are travels and many discussions. And, but congratulations for the data. The data are essential, as you know. <laughs>